Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Tizinski, and I'm the program chair of the Joseph Priestley Society. I'd like to welcome you to our October meeting, where we welcome Kobe Regev, who co-founder and CEO of Please Cheese, a uh, manufacturer and supplier of plant-based cheeses for pizza. As a fellow New Yorker, I'm disappointed because we wanted to have this as a hybrid meeting with in-person attendees so that we could actually sample some pizza on the lunch menu with Kobe's cheese. But unfortunately, that was not to be. And you will have to go to New York to uh, find his cheese and uh, hopefully enjoy a nice slice of thin crust pizza, not that Chicago stuff. <clears throat> so Kobe and Abev um, started Please Cheese. They had adopted a vegan diet and realized that no New Yorker could survive without pizza. So one thing led to another. They started making a product for their own use. And through some twists and turns, which Kobe will describe, now have a company that's making and supplying pizza uh, cheese to a number of pizzerias. So with that, um, I want to welcome Kobe and uh, turn the floor over to him. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you for everyone at the Science History Institute for inviting me. So like Bill mentioned, my name is Kobe, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Please. Um, my wife, Abev, and I are just a couple of New Yorkers who just happen to, be, uh, happen to be vegan. And when we changed our diet, our biggest pain point was life without decent pizza. And we quickly realized we weren't alone. There are over 50 million people in this country who are affected by lactose intolerance and even more who have severe nut and soy allergies. And that's why we created Please. It's a revolutionary new plant-based cheese made to melt and, op and work perfectly on all of our favorite comfort foods. It's made from all natural ingredients and it's uh, without any allergens such as dairy, soy, uh, or nuts, and which is very important to us because my wife's a teacher and we wanted to make sure our product was school safe. This category, our category of plant-based cheese has grown by, is going to be $7.5 billion in the next five years, but all like looking like this on pizza. And as a New Yorker, frankly, I was offended. And this is the results of five years of extensive research and development. Please is so good that people, especially New Yorkers, can't tell the difference. And here is the big difference. This is the, uh, uh, where it says them. It's the largest uh, producer of plant-based cheeses in North America. And I'm, I'm sorry, that doesn't look like a pizza. On the other side, that looks like a pizza. And that's the, the authentic experience that we were going for when we created this product. Again, you could see how different people have tried to solve the pizza problem. But the one thing I can tell you for a fact is none of these companies uh, are run by people from New York City. And you know we grew up with pizza and we know what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to taste like, and what the experience is supposed to be. And, and we're uh, in C, if you, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and most recently, as of October 1st, Pizza Today has said that uh, Please is New York City's most innovative plant-based cheese. And that's like, to me, probably the biggest honor we could have because this all started kind of just as a hobby. And now we are published in the largest pizza publication around the world. So what kind of, this is a st the way I like to tell this story. Um, when you really break it down, there's no such thing as luck as the way we perceive it. And the best way to understand it, uh, in my opinion, is through the word mazel. And if, for those of you who don't know, mazel in English translates to luck, but it's actually an acronym. And the three letters in Hebrew translate to being in the right place, at the right time 
with the right knowledge. So the more that you learn, the more that you study, the more you care about something, and the more that you keep on doing something, that is how you appear to be lucky. And it's just taking advantage of a situation and being passionate about everything that you do. So this started as a family business. My name's Kobe. My wife's name is Abev. And our couple's name before we had kids was Kobev. And this all started kind of just as a silly project in our home. And all of a sudden we, we became very popular online, which is something I'll talk about in a moment. And we, we never thought that beyond like the cuteness of um, our like doing these kind of events, um, making pizzas for our friends and family, we never thought it, it would take off or be anything real. Uh, and we're just amazed by the opportunity to, to, to help people in a way that we wish people would help us. <laughs> so my wife, Abed, was born in Ethiopia and she was raised in Israel. She came to New York 10 years ago. She is a teacher, a mother, and probably the most amazing people I've met in my entire life. And what I appreciate about her is that if it wasn't for her, this whole thing wouldn't happen. This, we would just be uh, continuing on with our lives and wishing there was better vegan pizza options in the world. Me, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in the 80s. I was influenced by Captain Planet and the Ninja Turtles. So my whole life motto is how do we save the planet and enjoy pizza? <laughs> and our story kind of starts in, uh, in different places, but in 2014, we changed our diet primarily for health reasons. Uh, at the time, I used to have a lot of um, acid reflux, and I was getting to the point where I thought I would need uh, heart medication, and, and just it, I was just getting to the point where I wasn't really healthy, especially with my diet. And when I heard about a uh, plant-based diet and what it could do for you, I decided, uh, along with my wife, that we do a 22-day uh, vegan challenge. And... I remember somebody kind of asking me in the middle of the challenge, uh, oh, so you're vegan now. Like, do you have superpowers? Like, can you jump higher? Do you have more energy? Like, what's different about you? And I kind of had to think about it for a second. I was like, oh, I can sleep all night. I didn't take Alka-Seltzer in, in, in a week, like to go to sleep. I, I actually am not tossing and turning. That's, that's, important. <laughs> it's like a great feeling. And, and so, of course, on the last day of that challenge, I just like ran to my favorite pizzeria and I got three huge slices and I felt like a million dollars for about three minutes. And then I felt like, like 20 cents uh, for the next three days. And that's kind of when I realized how much uh, what I used to eat has affected how I feel. And it was the beginning of our journey to com be completely plant-based. Now, as New Yorkers, it was very hard for us to give up on pizza, but after watching Forks Over Knives, uh, it changed my life and I, I, I wasn't willing to look back at animal products. And again, this is primarily for health reasons, but also you have to consider uh, what um, the North American diet is contributing to climate change. So anyway, just to move things along, one day I'm having lunch with my brother and I'm having a salad and he's, uh, you know, eating whatever. And he's an introvert, he's a quiet guy. And he kind of just looks up from his plate and he, he looks at me like this and he's like, what kind of New Yorker can live without pizza? What's wrong with you? And, and, and I was taken aback and I was like, where? Where did this come from? He's like, yeah, well, what are you doing? You're the guy that loved pizza more than anything. And now you're never gonna eat it again. And, and I just, uh, I remember like, he really got me. I was like, wow, he's right. What's wrong with me? And I, I called my wife and I told her that story and she just laughed and she's like, you know what? We're gonna show him. And she went to a, fair, to a local supermarket and she bought some dough uh, ingredients for a sauce and the available plant-based cheese. 
and it was the ugliest thing you had ever seen in your life. But to us, it was just so good because we hadn't had pizza in such a long time. So I looked at this and I went, okay, well, it tastes good, but there's no way any New Yorker is going to want this or pay money for this. Um, but we just continued and, and this was just a hobby for us. Um, uh, and that's how we created our Instagram page, uh, Kobev's Vegan Pizza. And again, this was all just something that was a hobby. It was for friends and family. And one day we're, uh, watching TV and we're in our pajamas is, you know, nine o'clock, eight o'clock at night. And somebody calls my wife and it's like an unknown number. And I go, you know what? Answer, see, see who's there. And, uh, she, and she picks up the phone and, and the person goes, hi, uh, yeah, we're, we're in New York City. Where on the Upper West Side is your pizzeria? And, and she's like, what? And we're like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've been looking for, we, we're in New York City. We find, we're finally in New York City. We want to have your pizza. And we're like, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it's, it's, it's just an Instagram page. It's not a real restaurant. But we thought about it and we're like, maybe there's something there. And um, again, it, it goes back to the, the vegan cheese wasn't good enough. And I went, you know what, there's got to be a better solution. And I started looking for, for different answers. And at the time, cashew cheese uh, seemed like the answer. It looked much better than the previous, like than the store bought versions. And we thought this is how we're going to launch um, our restaurant. We're going to have this cashew based cheese because it's easy to make. It's a little expensive, but we can make it affordable in house. And it could be something that, um, that we sell all day long. Uh, and to get experience in order to run my own pizzeria, I left my job and uh, which was a sales director for a luxury jewelry company. And I left that all behind and I went to work in a pizzeria. And it's probably the best thing I ever did in my life because it's the circumstances of being in that pizzeria that made me come up with the idea for please. So there was just like this one week where kids kept on coming in and asking different questions about the, the specific allergens in the pizzeria. So one kid asked me, uh, is there any soy in the oil that you, um, that you fry the French fries in? So I had to find out and there wasn't, but it, it made me think, okay, soy, that's a big problem for people. Uh, and then a, a few days later, another kid came in and they're like, yeah, is there any corn cornmeal in the crust of the pizza? And, and I thought about that, I was like, wow, corn, that's a big one too, like that not a lot of people think about. And then um, we got a call from a school and, um, and I just remember at that moment, I was like, you know what, I need to figure out what about nuts. And so I, um, I asked the person on the phone, I'm like, hi, yeah, uh, of course we'll fulfill your order. And, and, and by the way, uh, we're offering a brand new vegan cheese on our pizzas. Uh, would you like a free pie? And she was like, oh, that sounds so interesting. What's the cheese made out of? And I went, oh, it's cashew. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. This is a, our, our school and every school and every place that has children in it uh, don't allow any nut products. So I kind of was uh, taken aback by that. And I went like, ah, oh, what are we going to do? Like, are we going to have to put warning signs on our pizza boxes? Are we, are, and, and we definitely can't sell to school with this type of product. And I just, it really bothered me. So I went home uh, one day after a double shift and I was like, you know, I'm going to figure this out. There's got to be another way to do this. And that's the day I found out that Google has patent searches. And I looked up every iteration of plant-based cheese and the two themes that kept on coming back were either nut-based products or soy-based products. And I just kept on looking and looking and I'm like, at one point it's like three o'clock in the morning and I'm just on my phone kind of scrolling and looking. And, and as I'm like closing my eyes, falling asleep, I just kind of went, soy is a bean. What other beans are there? And the next day I went to the supermarket and I bought every single bean type there was. And I started experimenting and experimenting. And this 
is what please looks like. This was the first uh, homemade version that, that we made and it just started taking off. And so we were invited, oh, this is uh, the slide I was waiting for. Um, this is just people like, kept on asking us, when are you gonna open your pizzeria? Can you have it in a different country? We need it in Canada and Italy. It was, it was just getting very in, uh, daunting. And so uh, we got invited to the seed uh, the Whole Foods Seed and Wine Festival in Miami. And they told us, uh, if you can come, you can teach, uh, we're gonna be at the Botanical Garden and you can teach 300 kids how to make pizza. And we went, okay, that sounds really nice, but we can't afford that right now. We're on a pizza man and a teacher's salary. Uh, how are we gonna do that? So we, I, I just looked at my wife and I'm like, you know what, let's do a GoFundMe. And if we can reach our goal within two weeks, we'll go. And if we can't, then we tried. And, and we did the GoFundMe and we reached our goal in three days. So we just kind of looked at each other and we're like, oh crap, we actually have to do this. And again, one of the best things that we could have done because that's where we really, not just had the opportunity to make pizzas for kids, uh, but we had opportunity to speak with their parents. So like I said, at the time, we're 100% sure that we're gonna open our own pizzeria. But at the event, these parents kept on stealing their kids' slices and they're just amazed that there was no soy and there weren't any nuts and that it was very um, easy label to read. And, and it was, to them, it was delicious. So they, um, I'm just accepting someone. And they, um, Ask, kept on asking, like, could you open a pizzeria in Miami? Could you um, sell frozen pizzas? And then, and then they're like, no, wait, just sell the cheese. We just want the cheese. And we had no idea how to do that. And so we, when we got home, we found the Hot Bread Kitchen um, incubator, uh, business boot camp uh, incubator, which is uh, here in Harlem. And what they kind of helped us do is not only just help us realize and set up our company, uh, but they really put a lot of things in pr perspective for us. They're like, okay, how much could you make with a pizzeria? And in New York, the right location, you know, it's a couple million dollars a year. It's not, it's not bad. Uh, but then they're like, okay, what's your competitor doing in, in, in vegan cheese uh, right now? And I looked it up and they're doing like 55 million a year and so uh the guys uh behind us in the picture they just looked at us like don't you think that's a lot of pizzerias and and i agreed and then i thought about it more i'm like and, and not only that we would have a much greater impact on the world if we sold our our cheese to pizzerias and that way a lot more people would be able to experience it and they'd be able to experience the the twist that they grew up with, that they love the most. Like Bill uh, made a sly comment about Chicago style pizza. I will not comment on my opinion on Chicago style pizza, but I know that is a, a version of pizza that people very much love. And if I were to open my own pizzeria, probably wouldn't have a version of that. But there are a couple of restaurants in Chicago that are trying out uh, Please right now exactly for that opportunity. So it's just really funny uh, how things kind of come together. You really have to attack it and you have to be willing to, to pivot. You have to be willing to take people's advice. And we uh, continued on that path of working with different organizations. We were involved with uh, the Harlem, local, we still are involved in the Harlem Local Vendor Program, which is a partnership between Columbia University and uh, Whole Foods Market here in Harlem. And they take uh, companies that are based here and they kind of elevate them and, and, and help them create brands that will be successful at Whole Foods and Fresh Direct and supermarkets like that. So it's just been a tremendous opportunity. And we also were involved in Big Ideas First uh, Accelerator, and they were the first ones to really give us the capital and the push to take what we had, uh, what we were making in our kitchen and actually bring it to uh, full-scale production. So this is really how I like to look at it. There's the past of plant-based cheese, which is what we used to make. This is a, one of the first pizzas that we made. And then there's please. 
And I think you can all see together the difference. And, and, and to me, that is what tells me like when a New Yorker is looking for a solution for his pizza, he will not stop until he gets uh, a solution that looks exactly the way it's supposed to. Not just looks like it, tastes like it too. So this has not been a, a quick journey. It's something that we've been working on for a really long time. So it started off as a hobby back in 2015. And that's when things started really um, blowing up for us. We're invited to open our first location. And that's why I was looking to get uh, experience working in the food industry. So I worked at Saba's Pizza, which is a kosher pizzeria on the Upper West Side. And that's a, like a mom and pops type organization, but I wanted to understand the corporate mentality as well. So I went to work at a place called Juice Press. Uh, after the event in Miami, we got our first ever press mention. And that's how we also started meeting our first investors. And all together for, to create our first prototype, we raised $65,000. We worked with uh, Covance, which is one of the top dairy um, R&D labs in the country. And they, they were recently acquired by a different company. But what they, when, when they heard of me and I said I made a bean cheese, they kind of laughed. They're like, you can't, what? What are you talking about? And then I showed it to them and they got really excited. So they were the first ones to help me uh, take my, my vision and help us uh, scale it for production. Uh, since then, I've worked with a few other R&D companies because although they were very uh, much adept with uh, creating a tasty product, they uh, didn't have the background necessary to really uh, clean up the label the way that was important to me. Uh, and then we were involved in Plant-Based World Conference, which is where we debuted our product for the very first time. And that's when we met Big Idea Ventures. Uh, and which all brought us to the point where we could start production uh, with, with a co-man in Wisconsin. Before that, we were planning on doing all the production ourselves uh, and literally signed on with the co-man two weeks before the world shut down. And it's probably one of the luckiest things that happened to us. So plant-based world. Before um, I knew about the show, uh, I had just um, bombed on a pitch and I was really nervous and I could come up with a million reasons of to why I didn't do well on that pitch. But the reality is I did not do well, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and for a while I was really down on myself and I'm like, really, is this what I should be doing? Am I in the right industry? Maybe I should go back. Maybe I'm just stubborn. What do I do? And I'm just, again, middle of the night scrolling on my phone and I see an ad for plant-based world um, for, for this trade show and it was going to be at the Javits Center and I went man this is right in my backyard there's no way I'm missing out on it and so I called them up the next day and I, I asked them how much it was and when they told me literally the day before that I had gotten my tax return and it was exactly for the same amount so I knew that it was meant to be and I had to be there and it had to happen. Now, I had experience working in trade shows before, but I had no experience setting up the booth. So what I did is I called up one of my buddies from middle school, who's a graphic designer. And I was like, I, I need your help. I don't know what to do. I can't think about this. I don't have time. And he's like, no problem. Just draw me uh, what you want the booth to look like. And, and I'll help you make that happen. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, just draw it. And, and this is how the booth came together. So it just shows like, if you really believe in something and you have the right people in your network, um, you know, friends, family, uh, people are really passionate, just as passionate as you about what you're doing. Um, it's, you can really put anything together and you, you shouldn't just sit there and wait and wish you just, you have to go and do it. And the experience was overwhelming. We could not leave our booth. It was impossible uh, to get out of there because people just kept on coming over and they're like, wait, this is vegan? And, 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 and wait, this is with no nuts and no soy? 
what, where can we buy this? And so it, it became this like, this thing where people are just amazed, not just by the name, uh, but by the whole idea behind uh, the brand and our product. Um, and it was just such a great rewarding experience that I just, if, if any opportunity comes up at the last minute and, and you think, oh, I can't do that, I don't, don't listen to that voice, just go and do it. And here's just to show how things kind of changed in, within the last year. Um, our entire industry grew by 95% uh, during the pandemic. And then it grew by 54% by where it was before that. So our industry went from like this tiny segment in the plant-based market to uh, an open, like a very large one. And, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of different players uh, jumped into the game. And we're all kind of working on that same cu customer base, uh, the active, social, uh, socially conscious early adopter, that person who cares about what their family, what they are eating and what their family is eating. Um, and our customers are primarily food service for now. That's our biggest focus because for us, we're like, what's the lowest barrier of entry uh, to try a new product? And on pizza, I think uh, the people in this room would kind of agree, you're more likely to try a slice of pizza, a vegan pizza somewhere than you are to go all the way to the specialty aisle, all the way in the back uh, to find a vegan cheese. So we really wanted to, to make sure that as many people can try our product first. And then we have a, a lot of customers who are already interested in our product. So we've been shipping to them directly, um, trying it at a small scale to see uh, how we're going to grow. And as that's happening, we're now designing our final packaging uh, for grocery stores. We've done a lot, a lot, a lot of consumer research. To me, I, you know, I have a mac, uh, marketing background. I work with luxury goods. So I took the same kind of uh, passion that I had with working with, with expensive products and brought it down and boiled it to cost-effective products. And what we found is that uh, not only is this something that people would purchase often and repeatedly, um, but they were willing to pay more than what we wanted to sell it for. So we actually realized that we've created something that not only is, is missing from the market, but people want uh, more than anything, especially if it meets the, the criteria that I've set out. And, and here's just another uh, quick example of working with your customers. So all of our natural, uh, all of our ingredients are completely natural. Uh, and one of our iterations of please, we used an ingredient called uh, kappa carrageenan. Now that's a derivative of a seaweed, but there is some information out there that connects um, that specific ingredient with stomach issues. Now, if you were to just look at the label, it would seem like a clean label, but there are certain people out there that it, it's a big concern for. And, and we discovered that at Plant-Based World. So before we started this whole project, we were under the impression, we said we can't use any uh, X sounding ingredients because people don't want uh, an ingredient that they can't pronounce. Well, it turns out even sometimes people don't want ingredients they can pronounce either. Uh, and it's very important to, to listen to your customer and understand what their needs are and how they're gonna be using your product. And we've created our products uh, with a lot of um, attention to detail when it comes to the use case. So for instance, for our, uh, most uh, vegan cheese producers um, have all like went onto this one benchmark which is pizza. Now, when you make uh, a pizza, you put it in the oven, it has to sit there at a high temperature from at least anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes. And that means that the cheese needs to melt at a higher temperature and it has time until it can melt. That is a huge problem when it comes to food service, specifically for burgers. And a lot of you might've noticed out there that we have a uh, variety of uh, plant-based burgers in fast food restaurants, but they're still being served with regular cheese. 
And the reason for it is the meltability. And that's why we've created or are in the process of improving right now our low temperature uh, melting slices. So when you put it on a patty, it will melt from the internal heat of the burger and not the same way that the other vegan cheeses uh, need to be coerced to melt today. And that is a huge opportunity uh, for us because of the huge growing demand all over across the country and around the world uh, with some of these quick service restaurants. So to supply that demand, we've partnered with a, man with a manufacturer in Wisconsin and they're capable of producing anywhere between two and uh, six million pounds a week. Um, and that is what has been, been we, that is why we've been able to take this, this idea that we thought, you know, like I said, we're going to manufacture ourselves. So we thought we like the most we could do is like a thousand pounds a month. But now knowing that we could do a few million pounds, it not only brings down our cost, uh, but it also allows us to increase our distribution. So again, it, it, go, it went from something that we thought was just for us, and now it can be available for everyone. I, some of you might have heard of us uh, in the last year during the pandemic. Um, you know, we had a lot of plans to launch in commissaries and in a bunch of offices. Uh, and also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But unfortunately, uh, none of those places were open. So we had all of this product that we had just made uh, in our factory and we had no one to, to send it to, so to no, nothing to do with it. So I just went online and I found different vegan organizations, different vegan groups. And I said, hey, we have this new plant-based cheese. Does anybody know a restaurant? that might be interested in uh, trying it out. And we went from having, uh, you know, one potentially big customer that was out and we opened the door to 30, 40 new customers. Uh, and that's when I just started spending as much time as possible um, on LinkedIn and learning how I could really leverage and, and talk about my brand in a way that would engage with other people. And, and a lot of businesses, uh, a lot of uh, food businesses really uh, were attracted by what we had to say. Uh, and kind of, this goes back to my, my, my background. I, I kind of went, okay, it's one thing if I call a pizzeria and I say, I have a good plant-based cheese, you should try it. Um, nobody's going to listen to me. That, that was my thought. I'm like, who, who cares what some sales guy or some founder has to say about his pizza? And so I partnered with uh, Veg News. And uh, what you have on the screen is the old ad. This is, uh, this is the updated ad uh, for now. I don't know if you can see it. Um, but basically, our, our goal with this ad was you know, the, the, the most adamant early adopter is gonna be vegans. And they're the ones who are gonna go out of their way um, to, to a pizzeria and get them to, to use our product. And so far we've run this ad three times and I can't even begin to tell you how many uh, restaurants we've opened thanks to customers handing them uh, this ad. So it's just been such a awesome, positive uh, experience um, to go with this idea. And la this is where I'm going to end. Um, so this is my company. And I kept on thinking, what can I do to make a difference in the world uh, beyond just uh, creating a plant-based cheese? And I started researching the effects on climate uh, from cheese. And I, I learned that each pizzeria, uh, just by their requirements of cheese per year, are inadvertently creating one ton of CO2 by the production of that cheese. So to offset that, I basically, I increased our price by five cents per case, and we're able to plant a tree uh, because of that from every case that we sell. And to me, that's just been something super important. I, you know, I have kids and I wanna make sure that they have um, you know, a place to live, a nice, cool planet. 
uh, to be on uh, after I'm gone. And if there's anything that I can do to make a difference, uh, I think this is uh, the place I can start. Uh, I'm hoping to do a lot of other things as we grow, but this is where um, this is where we're beginning, and I'm very proud of what we're doing with the National Forest Foundation. So thank you so much for your time. If you'd like to learn more about this market, get a slice, find out where our pizzerias are located. Uh, you can reach us below. Our website is here, pleasecheese.com. And of course, come follow us on Instagram uh, through Please Cheese. Thank you so much for your time. Bill, I will let you take the floor. Thanks. Well, we have a number of questions. And again, if you're in the audience and have a question, please enter it in the chat function. But I'll start with some of the ones that we have. Um, one of the ones is, do you have any intellectual property in terms of patents or trademark? Yeah, so we um, the, the slides aren't updated. We recently were awarded our uh, trademark for please. Uh, and yeah, we are in the process of filing a utility patent. Uh, food is a little bit different because it's kind of a back and forth. You can't really patent a recipe, uh, but it's, it has to do with the process in which you make uh, your, your food product. So there is, um, we've done some research, there is um, some space to protect that. And we're literally um, speaking with our lawyers after this call to uh, see how, uh, how far we've gone. Okay, well, here's one you'll enjoy. It says, I'm not a pizza business owner, but would like to use this product in my own homemade pizzas. Where can I buy it? Um, first off, that's awesome. And I really appreciate uh, that you're reaching out like that. Uh, right now, currently, we're trying to work specifically in food service, but what I what I suggest is if you come onto our website uh, and fill in, a, like go and subscribe, uh, you'll be able to be on the mailing list and find out when we start doing more of our direct to consumer things. And if you reach out to me um, personally through the email sales at pleasecheese.com, uh, we'll be able to speak more about that opportunity. Okay. Uh... One of the comments here is that your product is, seems to be high in sodium. Can you reduce the sodium level? Uh, it's, it's actually lower in sodium than, than traditional mozzarella cheese. Um, but there is, a, there is some r wiggle room. Um, but right now, it's like if you look at the alternatives um, for our product, they're much higher uh, by like 20 or 30 milligrams. Uh, than what we use. Okay, well, question here is you considering pitching on Shark Tank? <laughs> uh, ho ho hopefully one day, I just don't want them to take my entire company. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is there a process for certifying that your product is vegan? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of funny. I'll be honest with you. It's, uh, you know, these organizations have um, you know, there's, there's different organizations that you can um, certify through. Uh, right now, I'm a member of the Plant-Based Food Association, so they're who I have uh, the certification through. These are kind of just brands, brand names, uh, like the Vegan Society, and there's like the V and a few others like that. Um, so they have to do an audit, like if, if, if you're interested in the process, they do an audit of your plant. They make sure that there's no cross-contamination with any uh, animal products, any allergens that are in the top eight. And, uh, and they verify all the ingredients uh, meet the standards that they set up. And, and then you get the certification. All right. Um, the pizzerias you work with, are they all vegan pizzas or pizzerias are they mixed? And when are you coming to Philadelphia? Um, so the to start off with the pizzerias that we're currently working with, none of them are vegan. Uh, and, and so the, these are the type of pizzerias, you know, that they, when I start talking to them, they're like, vegan? Uh, okay, maybe we'll try. And then they saw, once I started telling people where to find it, 
it, it, it grew and grew and grew. So they started off like with 20 pounds a month and now they're selling 120 pounds a month of please. Um, so it, it's like, what I like about working with a regular pizzeria is kind of proving to them that they're, they can increase their customers by having a product that's not just for vegans, it's for people who are lactose intolerant. So it allows uh, for them to open a lot more uh, doors and venues. Um, but the, to answer your question, there is a, a vegan pizzeria uh, in Philadelphia that I am sending samples to next week. And uh, there are a couple of other ones, but Bill, if, there, if you have a favorite, let me know and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll talk to them, I'll hook it up. I live 50 miles from Philly, so. Well, if there's a favorite wherever you live, let me know, I'll hook it okay. up, Okay, okay. Um, I noticed, here's a question. I noticed that your second green after water is coconut oil. Can you talk about the decision to use this particular oil? I understand it's perhaps the least healthy cooking oil thing. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to go into um, the health um, back and forth of what uh, that opinion on cooking oil because some people say that it's um, it, there's a, the whole study on why it's unhealthy was actually done by the animal uh, agricultural industry. So I'm not going to get into any of that, but I will tell you about why we decided to use coconut oil. Um, very specifically, um, when you make a, a cheese alternative, you need a source of fat. And um, because cheese is, is fatty, and the only alternative that does not carry on another taste is um, palm oil. And palm oil, I'm sorry, is just, although they say there are sustainable sources for it, to me, that's like, uh, I, I can't go down that route. So there are um, other, there's other blends to work with, but coconut as a fat has been very good. It, it, it delivers the flavor in a very uh, neutral and also kind of exciting way. One of the things that people have had trouble with uh, in my industry is, is muting the flavor of coconut oil because, or coconut in general, because it is something that carries on. And that's part of our process uh, is we've figured out how to do that as well. Okay, well, I'm going to skip one question that I'll come back to, but uh, comment that there is an ongoing contest for best Philly cheesesteak. It would be nice to see an entry with, please. I, you know, I love that too. So again, I, I, I have only been vegan for seven years. I grew up uh, like in America, you know, like I grew up in New York. I grew up here. I, I, Bill and, and some other people had a conversation about barbecue earlier and I, I was listening, I was like excited about it. Um, but I, I just choose not to eat uh, these things anymore. Uh, and also now that I understand a little bit more of the scale of, of how everything's done, um, but that's a whole different story. Um, I would love to be a featured on a, whether it's a vegan or non-vegan uh, Philly cheesesteak. It's been one of my dreams. Come like that would be a dream come true. I grew up like everyone watching in Fresh Prince. Uh, and there's a scene where he, uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff shows up with, a, with like a brown bag from Philly. And it's just like one of those things that sit with you for the rest of your life. And you're like, I want that. I want to be on in that bag too. Wit or without, okay. wit please. That's what I want, wit please. <laughs> okay, you're gonna replace Wiz. You, well, who knows? All right, what, um, here's a question. What is the basic recipe for vegan cheese that you started from? Uh, the basic recipe for cashew cheese, there's a lot of different ways um, to find this online, but it's really uh, a mixture of blended um, cashews uh, a source of fat, which at the time I was using coconut yogurt, but some people use soy yogurt. I was just trying to avoid soy. Uh, and then there's a few other ingredients for flavor. Uh, nutritional yeast is a really uh, big one. And then if you want it to kind of congeal and like set up, you have to, um, you have to cook it with uh, agar, agar, agar. And agar is, is a great natural ingredient uh, but unfortunately, like for me, some people it affects them negatively and like taste wise, it didn't affect me, but when you cook it, you smell it. And for some reason it just triggered like a sinus headache. I don't know how to explain it. 
Um, so it was very hard for me to cook with. And that's one of the reasons I was, I was looking for another ingredient. But before you cook it with the agar, um, I suggest letting it ferment for about three days. And so you'll start with a, a liquid consistency. And then uh, after it's fermented, it'll become more of a yogurt. And that's when it's good. Okay, here's a question regarding the packaging. What are the considerations of designing sustainable, recyclable packaging for perishable foodstuffs? Is it even possible? That's a wonderful question. It's some, so because we're in the beginning of our, and I, I, I have to be very honest about this, because we're in the beginning of our journey, we're at the mercy of our co-man at the many our manufacturing partners. So we have to kind of fit in with what they have available. But in the past year, I've done tremendous research on uh, compost, compostable and biodegradable packaging. And something I found fascinating, I didn't even realize wasn't a thing anymore, uh, but cellophane is made from cellulose. And all packaging in the United States used to be made out of cellophane up until 1978. So anything that was made with cellophane doesn't exist anymore in the ether. And then the guy who was t explaining to me about this is like, yeah, but you can still find like Doritos bags from 1979, like floating in the ocean, uh, what the, the year they switched to plastic. So that is the direction I want to go in is cellophane. There's another company um, that makes um, a bag that kind of um, you take it apart and by taking it apart, it releases some sort of microorganism or, or no, sorry, it does not release a microorganism. It makes it tasty for microorganisms. So when it's thrown away uh, in the trash or into the compost, um, it, it, it gets digested faster by, um, by everything in there. Okay, great. Um, you know, obviously taste is a key property of, of what you're doing. And you've talked about melting point. Are there other aspects of the sensory experience like mouthfeel and odor that you had to work through? Yes, yeah. something I usually talk about, I realized I forgot to. Um, for, I'm not a super taster. I'm not a chef. It's not my background, but I'm very, very sensitive to texture. And for me, like one of the problems with the pre-existing products uh, that you just bought in a store is that they were very sticky. And so the best selling uh, version, try not to use names, was like roof of your mouth sticky. And then the, the people who took them off the throne, which had a fantastic melt and a good flavor was teeth, teeth sticky. And so that stickiness is not something I, I personally look for when I eat pizza. Uh, like I, I want stretchiness, but not stickiness. And so that's something that we work tireless, tirelessly on um, to make sure that the texture was absolutely perfect. And now something to just add to that point that I found fascinating is that kids don't like mozzarella at first. And, and I, I and so they actually prefer please because it's an easier texture. Mozzarella is very chewy and it's, you can kind of choke on it if you don't eat it right. And so kids, like they don't like things that are too chewy. Like even my daughter, I made her a sandwich the other day. She asked me to cut off the crust and I'm like, oh yeah, they don't like to chew too much. And so like, yeah, this is a, just a picture uh, that I love showing off. Like this is uh, somebody's kid, the first time they ever had please. And it's like, this is a, like at the moment of eating it. And just, she was just so happy that she could have another bite and another bite and not have to kind of choke on it. So it's, so we're not exactly the same texture, 100% as a mozzarella cheese, uh, but the texture that we do have is a very creamy and rich and people actually tend to enjoy that. Okay, great. Um... You know, some of the other competitors in plant-based meats like Impossible and Beyond had a lot of regulatory hurdles to go through. Was the same happening in your case? That's a, a wonderful question. I actually, all of our ingredients uh, have all existed on the market before. Uh, although we kind of 
um, work and do things differently than what is actually like what the other what our competitors are doing in plant-based cheese our products uh, like our ingredients are all already FDA certified so we didn't have to go through any process of um, those kind of hurdles like going through the USDA or uh, you know uh, impossible has the heme so it had to be tested in a certain way and we we did luckily we didn't have to go through any of that okay uh, can you talk a little bit about your journey in finding and setting up your co-manufacturer? Oh my God. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that, that could be a whole like other lecture. Yeah, that could be a whole other lecture. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, okay. So how we thought, that, like, and, and, and this goes back to um, being willing to pivot and being willing to learn uh, from, from, from other people and not being too stubborn. You got to be stubborn, but not too stubborn. And, um, so at first our goal was to produce our products ourselves. And we found, uh, through Hot Brick Kitchen that I mentioned earlier, they actually have a commercial shared kitchen in Harlem. And we really wanted to work with them, but unfortunately, um, they didn't have, everything was a shared space. And even though we, we really were like, could you make a kosher room? Could you make a room that's gluten free? Could you like accommodate us if we rent like a, our own room for enough time? Would you be able to do that? And, and unfortunately just the way the organization was set up, um, they couldn't accommodate um, that specialty need. And my biggest fear was selling a product that was supposed to be allergen friendly and then having it processed in a location where we do everything else. So that was um, one of our first challenges. Um, how we solved that challenge was we connected with uh, Rutgers University and they have the Food Innovation Center. And we literally uh, wrote um, a check to, to lease out the same room that Impossible Foods used because that's where they started. That was their pilot plant. And we, we, were, we put in the, the lease, we put in the application, I started um, uh, hounding down equipment. And uh, at the time I, I was in that accelerator of Big Idea Ventures and the, the mentors there, that's their experience is working with large scale co-manufacturers. So one of the mentors, he's like, listen, Kobe, you're doing everything right. And if, if, I, if this was me and my company and I had like a huge checkbook, I would probably do the same thing, but you're in a startup mode and your every dollar counts. Um, and, and, and what are you gonna do now? Hire people and learn how to do it and bring all these people in and, and, and be dependent on, 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 on um, you know, your, you, they will be dependent on you and their livelihood. And it was very hard for me to accept that, but I listened and we interviewed a few different uh, facilities around the country. And we found a, a, a co-man in uh, Wisconsin. And to me, that's like, you know, my dream when I started this whole thing, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we we're made in Wisconsin or in Vermont? And, uh, and when, when we found this place, I was like, oh, what, what, wait, we can actually be made in Wisconsin? Okay, I'll do that. And it was just a really rewarding experience because, you know, before this, I've been making like one pound at a time in a small like cooker that I have, like a specialty cooker that I have for, for plant-based cheeses. Uh, and the first time we worked with them, they made 250 pounds like at, at, at one sitting. And I was just like sitting there blown, blown away by like the sheer magnitude. And another thing that, that was really important for me is quality control and quality assurance and not having to do it myself I could rely on, on somebody else's experience in quality control and making sure that everything met the highest standards uh, as far as production. Um, and then as I kind of uh, mentioned earlier, right as we signed our contract to work with the Coman uh, and, and gave up on our lease uh, opportunity with Rutgers University, uh, that's when the world shut down. And literally, if I had to like, hire people and then fire them or uh, buy all this machinery and not be able to use it. It just, it would have destroyed us. So, um, you know, back to uh, just being in the right time, right place at the right time with the right knowledge uh, and accepting other people's knowledge as well. Muzzle up. <laughs>
They'll speak Yiddish as a second language. That's that's why we get along. All right. I don't really have any more questions coming in. So let's take this opportunity to at least golf clap Kobe and thank him. I think his uh, passion and uh, desire to make please a success is something that can be we can all learn from. And I think that uh, you know, what we've seen is, is if you've got an idea and pursue it with enough passion, you can make a business out of it. And uh, hopefully he'll be able to eat a lot more than please for the rest of his life. <laughs> and uh, I also want to, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic. We talked about sustainable packaging and uh, our November 11th program is keeping a fresh film technology for enhanced shelf life of food. And uh, I'm sure one of the topics we're gonna have a, a, a panel discussion. And I think we'll have uh, some discussion of what we need to do to address some of the sustainability questions of, uh, of packaging. So it was a nice segue. I'm glad that someone brought forth that question. I'm glad that you had such a uh, compelling answer. So yeah, well, I know I'm going to be there for that one. That's for sure. That's I'm going to have the same question and see what we can do. All right. Well, hopefully, um, we'll all see please in our supermarkets at some point in the near future. And if not, we'll all just email you and uh, ask for samples so we can make cheese at home. Uh, pizza at home, but only thin crust, no thick crust Chicago stuff. No comment. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, this program has been recorded and will appear on the uh, Science History Institute YouTube channel. So I'm sure we'll get plenty of views at post facto. And uh, hopefully that will help take your company to newer and greater heights. So thank you again, thank you so Kobe. Much. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for, um, you know, just all our conversations up to this point. Please keep in touch with me. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone who here came. And uh, with that, I think we'll conclude our program.